Let us now turn to uh, our distinguished panel. Uh, we've got a great lineup for you here. Uh, we're going to start, I, let me introduce the, uh, the panel first and then we'll start with uh, a Deputy Assistant Secretary Vikram Singh who I'll introduce first. For those of you who don't know uh, Vikram, uh, he is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for South and Southeast Asia uh, in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Defense. Um, Vikram is a, a very capable, uh, relatively young leader. Uh, there's a little gray in that beard, but uh, not much. He's actually done um, an incredible amount of work uh, in the region in, a, in, a, um, in his career. Prior to this position, he was senior advisor to the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy on Asian and Pacific Security, Deputy Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan at the Department of State, and Senior Advisor on Afghanistan and Pakistan at the Department of Defense. What his uh, bio doesn't say is he's one of the uh, few who had the honor to work um, uh, right next to and, and with uh, Ambassador Holbrook, uh, Richard Holbrook. And um, a lot of his toughness <laughs> and his views uh, were formed uh, during those days. Before that, he was at the Center for National, uh, for New American Security. Um, and did some very interesting things across South Asia with the Ford Foundation and Voice of America. Next to him is His Excellency Hayono Isman, who's the Vice Chair of Commission One. Uh, and for those of you that don't follow the, uh, the DPR or the DPR in, uh, in Indonesia, this is a very important commission. It's the Commission in Charge of Defense, Foreign Affairs, and Information and intelligence. It doesn't say that here. I don't know why. In <laughs> um, the People's Representative Council. Uh, Pak Hayano is a member of the, of the, of the um, Parliament of Indonesia's House of Representatives. And uh, um, he was elected to his post in 2009 as a member of the Democrat Party. As a senior politician, he served as Minister of Youth and Sports from 1993 to 1998, and was a member of parliament in 19, from 1987 to 1992, and from 92 to 93 under the Golkar party. And finally, uh, last and certainly not least, the Honorable Paul Wolfowitz, who is former ambassador to Indonesia and is a, uh, a leading scholar uh, uh, on many issues, uh, security related and foreign policy issues at the American Enterprise Institute, I think uh, Secretary Wolfowitz is well known to all of you. Uh, he was uh, president of the World Bank, a deputy secretary of defense, and as he mentioned earlier in this conference, um, did you say 30 years ago? <laughs> assistant, uh, assistant Secretary of State for East Asia and the Pacific. But to his credit, uh, I, I walk the halls uh, of the EAP front office all the time, and that picture of you 30 years ago doesn't look a lot different than... Uh, than <laughs> than you look now. Um, <laughs> so uh, we've got a great lineup here, and I, I suspect we'll have a terrific discussion afterwards. Let me uh, turn to Vikram to tee us off. Vikram. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ernie. Thank you for pulling this together, to everyone who helped pull this together. It's a true honor to be sitting here with uh, Secretary Wolfowitz. I'm sorry, I'm going to call you Secretary Wolfowitz, <laughs> although you are Ambassador Wolfowitz in this context, but that's how I most know you from my time in the Pentagon. Um, uh, and you've had such a distinguished group today. And uh, uh, His Excellency Hayano, it's nice to be here with you as well. You look day to day into the issues we're talking about here on security for Indonesia. Um, I'm going to try to be very, very brief because I think the real value is I'm going to get into the Q&A of these, uh, of these discussions. So, you know, very quickly, I just think um, many people have commented on the fact that this is sort of un unparalleled. Uh, the room was not only packed to capacity this morning with several hundred people, but it's packed to capacity this afternoon. Yes, and if you can hold on to a crowd in the afternoon, something really big is going on. Uh, the the, the the fact is, you know, the, the big news on the defense side for the United States and Indonesia is that we have a very normal, positive, constructive defense relationship. Uh, we wouldn't have been saying that just a few years ago. In fact, in 2005, we didn't really have a defense relationship at all. That's when we reestablished and started to normalize military ties. So from no bilateral activities, today we have something like 200 
bilateral activities every year. Uh, it's really a phenomenal change. This has happened in the spirit of a comprehensive partnership, something that has been uh, developed across the board by all elements of our, uh, of our two countries, by our State Department and Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Defense, and, and it's, uh, it's something that has been building trust and habits of cooperation, and it's, it's an effort that's been making really uh, tremendous progress. We've, we've heard today a lot about um, Indonesia's role as a regional leader, and in every aspect of what we're doing, I think what underpins the U.S. Uh, thinking is uh, being a partner with Indonesia and helping it in that regional leadership, supporting Indonesia as, a, as sort of a, a unique leader in the region. I noted when the uh, foreign minister this morning pointed out the challenges as trust deficit, uh, lingering territorial disputes and sovereignty and sovereignty issues and managing change, that you can actually look at each of those and see where Indonesia has stepped up when those problems become significant issues. Uh, trust issues, he talked a lot about North Korea, but I think the difficulties um, last year in coming to agreement on a, on, a, on a statement on the South China Sea, you saw Indonesia step in and try to bring people back together and bring countries back together and come up with the six principles. Um, when, uh, when you see territorial disputes being persistent, Indonesia is always offering creative ways forward, creative solutions, ideas, energizing the discussion. Um, and when you look at uh, the areas that I focus on, like our support for Indonesia's military modernization and looking at how we deal with common security challenges, um, Indonesia is also taking a very forward-looking approach, focusing on things that really matter in this particular area, maritime domain awareness, uh, you know, building capabilities for counterterrorism and counterproliferation, things in those, in those areas. Um, we are focusing with Indonesia in maritime security, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, and peacekeeping. Those are the areas in which we probably have the most active uh, cooperation. Um, that happens bilaterally, and increasingly, that happens multilaterally. We heard several people today talking about the creation of the ADMM Plus, the ASEAN Defense Ministers Meeting, which will have a ministerial this August. Uh, that uh, construct has moved with really astounding speed to real, very concrete operational cooperation amongst the ASEAN member countries and the eight plus countries. Um, we, with Indonesia, co-chaired the counterterrorism working group of that, of that body, and we'll be holding counterterrorism exercise later this year um, involving all the countries. And uh, Brunei will be hosting a, a, a humanitarian assistance disaster response and military medicine exercise later this year, which will also bring basically all of the countries together, many of them actually providing significant assets, ships, helicopters, et cetera, and working together for the first time. Um, the, the, and across the board, Indonesia has shown leadership uh, in, in, uh, in this regard, and really its, its hosting of ASEAN, its ASEAN chairmanship was a watershed year. Um, another area that is, that, is, that is really new in this partnership has been defense trade. Uh, you know, the, the, the Indonesian military has a lot of work to do in terms of modernization. And we talk about uh, how they're going to structure, what their priorities are going to be, and we're looking at how U.S. industry can be a partner in that. My, uh, my deputy, General Malavet, was actually just out with, uh, uh, with Secretary uh, uh, Budiman in Arizona the other day and looking at, you know, going to look at various U.S. systems. and and things of that nature. So this area is completely a new, um, a, 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 a new area of cooperation, and it's actually fundamentally tied to our strategic aims, because we know that as India, Indonesia modernizes military, it will contribute to common regional aims of stability, security, and shared prosperity. Um, you know, I think I'll just wrap up by saying that the, uh, the the other part of this growing relationship has been 
watching the professionalization and transformation of the Indonesian military um, and the, 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 the talk about IMET and other things from Secretary Bodiman, I think was really important. We have a, we have a very profoundly uh, important opportunity and role in helping militaries figure out how they can be the best that they can be um, and, and be the best that they can be in their societies. And so we're very committed to continuing expanding that cooperation in the realm of training, education, and professionalization for the Indonesian Armed Forces. I'm going to wrap it up there. Mm -hmm. I said five minutes. That was probably five minutes. And uh, there's a lot we can talk about in question and answer. Thank you. Thank you very much. About exactly five minutes. Uh, Pakayono, uh, how do things look from uh, your perch in uh, De Payar? Uh, thank you, Mr. Bauer. Firstly, I would like to appreciate what you're doing <laughs> in this uh, important <laughs> conference by CSIS. It is important because we are meeting between friends, old friends. We may have differences, and we will continue to have differences in the, in the future, but through friendship, we will try to talk to each other to solve our differences. And this forum is important in Indonesia since Indonesia has become a democracy nation by seeing Pak Harto giving way to democracy and also the military. And this is the contribution that not many people know that without their willingness to give up political activities in the past, the, the Indonesian military, we will have difficult times in succeeding democracy in Indonesia. Therefore, for Commission One, it is the military, the Indonesian military is unique and special. And we hope that the Indonesian military not just simply doing their job as a defense of uh, her country, but also to ensure that democracy is to stay mm. in Indonesia. Therefore, it is imperative for a nation not just to support the military to modernize its equipment, but also to ensure that the personnel welfare is taking care properly. I saw the film start by Tom Hanks returning George. That is a very interesting film. How you appreciate your soldier. Although you may not agree with the Iraq wars, but when every soldier is coming home in a casket, everybody giving their respect to the soldiers. I think this is something that should happen in Indonesia. Because soldiers, their professions are risking their lives for country. Beside firefighters, I think soldiers doing just that. That is why we have to respect our soldiers, our military. And it has been mentioned by the Secretary General, or the Pak Purnomo Yuskiantoro, our minister, the increase has been incredible in, our, in the budget. And we do this simply because the economic is doing also well. And we appreciate the assistance of American administration on having the opportunity to participate in the EDA, Excessive Defense Article. I remember with the, yeah, we, we go in hand in hand in, in tandem with Ambassador Dino, meeting with uh, congressmen, meeting with the defense, your defense department and your secretary department on the F-16s. And we hope that this also can happen on the Apache helicopters, which will be stationed in uh, the NATO, uh, the, uh, in the north of Indonesia. And uh, as a mere, more function as a deterrent factor, 
If you notice that Singapore, small nations, she has 100 Leopard tanks. Indonesia only have 30 AMX tanks, which is 30, 40 years old. So this is a, that's why we support the Indonesian military. And yes, at this forum, I like also to appreciate the forum. It has bring out, it has bring out the best of our young leaders. Minister Marty, Ambassador Dino, and businessman John Riyadi. Yeah. You show to, to, the, to the gathering that Indonesia has capable leadership. That is why they can solve problems. The challenge for Indonesia is how to ensure that every election create not just a leader who understands and preserves democracy, but to ensure the Indonesian society, the Indonesian people, stays with democracy. Democracy with its own identity. And it's different from your democracy. Your democracy, under the context of freedom of expression, allows critical uh, statement on religious matters. In Indonesia, although we are a democratic nation, we will, we will not allow, we cannot allow blasphemy. It's just a different identity. That is why this meeting is very important, especially for parliaments. So we have constituents in Indonesia that not of Indonesians understand correctly America. To me personally, the United States, maybe you made some mistakes, <laughs> but you don't conquer other nations. You try to solve problems by military use, but you never conquer other nations. This is something that is not known by mostly the Indonesian public. They see America as a big superpower, trying to play boss everywhere all over the world. But we, if we see deeply on how you try to, uh, sh to promote democracy, it's not about conquering other nations. It's about democracy and understanding democracy. It's the only way to solve problem peacefully within a country or within between countries all over the world. That's the aim. Therefore, in Commission One, although we are on the Dove side <laughs> of, 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 of a matter, but we would like to see the Indonesian military, especially a Dove, which is sufficiently armed. <laughs> a Dove without armament is naive ready to be cooked. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, military is important for Indonesia, and we learn from the US how you maintain your military in the proper way. Yeah, we have mistakes. We have personnel uh, doing, uh, make a wrongdoing, and hopefully in the near future that there will be a military court for that, since in our in our law, it only can be dealt on military court. I agree in the future, when it's in, 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 in connection with the public, it should, go, it should go to a civilian court, just to make sure that the military stays on its path. But at the present time, the law stipulates that any wrongdoing by the military, including connecting with the public, should be done through a military court. And this is going to happen to a certain COPASUS member, which happens in Solo uh, several weeks ago. And this is a 
something that is uh, shameful to Indonesia and to the unit of Kopassus. And I think they learn, they will learn from this. And therefore, it is uh, important for Indonesian military to be trained through IMAT program. Yeah. Because not just train a military personnel, but how to understand democracy. Yeah, I, I notice in the US military also that happens. Although you have the best system, but you still have soldiers doing something wrong. And you deal with that in a proper and, and a speedy way so these things do not create bad news for the society, especially for democracy itself. So I stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Uh, <laughs> it's always good to get spontaneous applause after your, uh, it's a good sign. Um, let me turn to uh, Secretary Wolfowitz, please. <clears throat> Pat Paul is just fine. <laughs> Um, I'm going to, instead of giving you a structured analysis, let me tell some anecdotes, each of them with a point, uh, but I won't try to make the point. You can figure out. And let me start at the risk of waking up those of you who are asleep or embarrassing those of you who are roughly my age, because this is sort of a hidden way of asking you how old you are. Raise your hands if you have any idea who Alan Lawrence Pope was, or still is. I think he's still alive. Okay, well, we have an educated audience, but still, I think that's under 10%. Um, Alan Lawrence Pope was one of the CIA's great triumphs of the 1950s. Uh, when the Promesta Rebellion started, they somehow decided, I'm not sure on whose authority, um, certainly unknown, I think, to the embassy in Jakarta, that the U.S. should support the Promesta Rebellion. They put together this weird little air force in eastern Indonesia. Pope was a decorated Korean War veteran, excellent pilot, or fairly good pilot, I guess. He conducted a number of bombing runs uh, on the strategically critical island of Morotai. He bombed a marketplace in Ambon, and after about three weeks of these rather feckless military exercises, he was shot down. George Benson, who many of us, I think, know, again, I'm not asking your age, but George Benson, who was then the army attache in Jakarta, was hauled in by General Nasutian, who said, what in God's name are you Americans doing? Here, we, the Indonesian military, are trying to provide some restraint against the growth of communism in this country, and all you're doing, or all the CIA is doing, is tearing the country apart. If that isn't a sufficient explanation for a certain Indonesian allergy to foreign troops on their territory, uh, you could go back to the War of Independence, but I just think that little data point about the American presence, so to speak, is, is worth remembering. Not maybe remembering too much. It would be better if everyone forgot it, but still not everyone has forgotten it. Second anecdote, when I was ambassador, General Mordani was fond of telling the press that there is no Soviet threat. Remember, this was still the height of the Cold War, more or less, although we had no idea it was going to end quite so soon. And I said, what on earth are you doing that for? And he said, well, there, there, there is no Soviet threat as long as you Americans are around. I said, well, that's quite a qualification. And I said, you could at least say that. He said, well, if I acknowledge there was a Soviet threat, my boys, as he liked to call pretty much every other general in the army, my boys would bankrupt this country trying to deal with something that we can't deal with. In the meantime, we are dealing with our real problems, which are internal security. I don't think things have changed all that dramatically in the subsequent 25 years. And I think it's very important, especially, forgive me, those are my friends in the defense industry, if we go hawking advanced aircraft or other things to Indonesia, it may not be what they really need, although I agree with Pahayona that they certainly need more modern equipment, but they need it economically. Third comment is about IMET. Uh, one of the most many remarkable things that happened in the years 1998-1999 was the sudden, abrupt, and complete abolition of the Ministry of Information and the lifting of all censorship regulations. Now, I know some of my Indonesian friends would say, yes, it's gone much too far already, <laughs> but I don't think any of us in this room would say it was such a bad thing to do. It was done by a general, I was going to say retired, but he may still have been active duty, 
And when asked why he had done it, he said, well, at Command and Staff College at Fort Leavenworth, we were allowed to take an elective, and I took mine on public opinion and democracy. And they taught us about the value of freedom of the press. Uh, by the way, the more you learn about this general, the more you realize this was not his normal mode of behavior. But he had picked up something very valuable through the IMET program. More importantly, perhaps the current president serving his second term in Indonesia is in the honor roll as our other former presidents of the Command and Staff College at Leavenworth. And I believe he went through IMET in an earlier incarnation as well. Uh, and I don't think it's an accident that President SBY has an appreciation of democratic institutions even while recognizing, as you have said, that democracy in Indonesia will be different than democracy in the United States. But many of the same principles apply and there's nothing like having been through an American system to at least understand our principles, which may or may not apply everywhere else. My fourth anecdote concerns what happened in um, the, in December of 2004, January of 2005, after the tsunami hit Aceh. And we, the United States military, came with capabilities that no other country in the world could have provided. Uh, and we were able to bring food and water to people who were literally on the verge of starving to death or dying of thirst because the devastation was unbelievable. I uh, flew over it a few weeks after the tsunami and it really looked to me like Hiroshima or the pictures of Hiroshima. In the very early stages, Vice President Yusuf Kala, and I'm not naming him in order to cast blame, but he initially said, we don't need any foreign military. And I mentioned Pope because I think that's probably part of what he had in mind. But it is really quite striking that within probably just a few hours of his making that statement, he had stopped making that statement and no one else was saying it. The American military stepped in in a purely humanitarian way, doing something, as I say, that no other country in the world could have done, uh, and saving probably tens of thousands of lives. And from a very, if you are one of these so-called realists, who I don't think are all that realistic, who want to just dismiss this as, well, that's nice, it's humanitarian, then think about the fact that the, according to the Pew polls, and I am going to butcher this, or not butcher this, I'm going to give you round numbers. Roughly, 75% of Indonesians had a negative view of the United States before the tsunami, and roughly 75% had a positive view of the United States after the tsunami. And I'm sure that's gone down a little bit with drone strikes in Afghanistan and maybe even the pivot to Asia. I don't know. But it's still up pretty high, and it is very important. It's an asset that the United States has in many places, but particularly, I would say, in countries like Indonesia that really want to be our friends uh, and look for good reasons to be that way. Um, getting a little more contemporary, uh, I believe it was just a few months ago that some, I guess you could say literally homemade terrorist attacked a police station in Tasik Malaya. He started out throwing a pipe bomb, shades of pressure cookers. You've heard of pressure cookers and if you haven't, your neighbor can explain it. Uh, that didn't go off unlike the one at the Boston Marathon. Uh, so he tried using a homemade gun. I don't know how you make a homemade gun, but that didn't go off either. And when the police tackled him, he resorted to a knife, but he was killed. Subsequently, eight people suspected of being behind this attack were killed very quickly by Indonesian counterterrorism forces, and 17 were arrested. The New York Times described all of this, and this is a quote, recent police operations, planned bombings, and attacks highlight Indonesia's continuing terrorism problem. Uh, it seems to me you could have written that same sentence and substituted United States for Indonesia. To say that Indonesia has a continuing terrorism problem makes it sound as though Indonesia is a dangerous place. And what impresses me, actually, is what an extremely successful job they have done. Um, and in a way, what impresses me even more, and I will tell this story and somebody quietly tell me afterwards if I have my facts wrong, but I was told that after the 2009 bombings of two hotels in Jakarta, which were aimed at Americans, although I think Indonesians increasingly understand that terrorism aimed at anyone in Indonesia is an attack on the country. Uh, the people behind these suicide bombers were 
captured, or excuse me, they were trapped and killed rather quickly. And I was told, this is the fact I would like to confirm or refute, that there wasn't a single Muslim cemetery in Indonesia that was willing to bury these SOBs. That tells you something really quite impressive, not only about the effectiveness of Indonesia's professional counterterrorism forces, who are getting a lot of good, quiet cooperation from both the United States and Australia, I think. Uh, and it's a real success story, but it also tells you something about, I think, a very positive public attitude in Indonesia toward terrorism. By the way, there was also some remarkable cooperation between uh, the FBI and Indonesian security forces in the investigation of that incident about eight years ago where several American teachers were killed on the way to the Freeport mine in, in West Irian. And Patty Spear, who was the widow of one of the people killed, was converted from being a critic of Indonesia to being a uh, one-woman uh, advertisement for Indonesian police work after she had seen what they had done, and for the FBI. I can't finish, though, without mentioning, a, my view, quite negative note, and I think it's potentially quite serious, and that is while the attitude toward terrorism has been as good as anyone could have hoped for, and the professional effectiveness against terrorism as good as anyone could have hoped for, the same cannot be said about the attitude toward religious extremism or the approach of the government toward really shocking attacks on not only churches, but even on, or maybe especially on, minority Muslim Ahmadiyya mosques that are considered by the people destroying them and murdering, and murdering in a most vicious way, uh, people who are adherents of those sects. Uh, it's largely, I think, organized by the, the Front Pambele Islam, the Islamic Defenders Front, and they are admittedly just a sliver of Indonesia's 200 plus million people. But the government is confronting it, I would say, with about the same attitude as southern states confronted the Ku Klux Klan in the 1950s. There is a virtual impunity for these murderers. And I, for those of us who, and I certainly, in case you don't know it, I have to say Indonesia is my second favorite country. I did what no ambassador is supposed to do. I almost fell in love, but I waited until after I had left. <laughs> <laughs> but this is not the Indonesia that I came to admire, and it's not the Indonesia I hope of the future. But it is really important to confront thugs like that early on rather than wait until they become so strong and so menacing that it becomes very dangerous to do so. So I don't want to get into an argument about blasphemy laws. I'm a skeptic about them. But certainly, if you're going to talk about blasphemy laws, then you better talk about people who are violating some of the most fundamental principles of Indonesian democracy. Um, let me just conclude on, on two notes. First of all, uh, I really appreciate what Pahayono said about most Indonesians don't understand the historical restraint with which the U.S. has used its military force. I know that's not quite the right word. I have to search for the right word. But we don't go around conquering countries. And even uh, in the case of Iraq, which we were accused of seizing for its oil, whatever mistakes we made, we clearly weren't there to take over the country. There's an important fact which I would urge anyone in this audience to think about when you're talking to Indonesian audiences, and I guess I would ask you in particular. Uh, and frankly, I would criticize my own government under both this administration and the previous one, and I could go back even further, for how little we mention the fact that by my count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times in the last 22 years, not counting Iraq and Afghanistan, which would make it nine times, the United States military has acted sometimes at great risk to American lives, sometimes in a purely humanitarian fashion, to rescue populations that were predominantly overwhelmingly Muslim. And if you doubt my list, I start with Kuwait, 
1991, Northern Iraq, 1991, Somalia, 1992, which was humanitarian, although Americans were eventually killed, Bosnia, 1995, Kosovo, 1999, Aceh and the tsunami, 2004 and 5, and Libya most recently. I would also contend, but I'm not trying to start a big argument here, that what we tried to do, and we can debate how successfully in both Iraq and Afghanistan, was to liberate a population, not to conquer it. And whatever problems they have today, they had horrible problems under the previous regimes. And that's another 50 million Muslims. But the notion that the US is at war with Muslims because some of our enemies happen to be Muslim and we happen to attack them, not only are we not, but the American record in the last 12 years with regard to our own Muslim citizens is by historical standards exemplary. That doesn't mean there aren't, as, as in your other cases, incidents where Muslims have been mistreated in this country, but they're astonishingly small. And if you compare them to the shocking treatment of Japanese here in World War II by such great civil libertarians as Hugo Black, Earl Warren, and the President of the United States himself, Franklin Roosevelt, we have come a long way. We have a lot that other people should understand, I'm not saying that we should boast about it, but I think it would be helpful in our relations with Indonesia to develop a better understanding of what we've done right as well as what we've done wrong. And I think the same thing goes for you. I have one concluding comment, and that is no one yet, I'm about to violate the rule, has, at least in our panel, has mentioned the infamous word dwifungsi. And I think that is testimony to what you have correctly said has been a remarkable role played by the Indonesian military in this democratic transformation, including at least going back as far as the historic events of 1998, when, as I read what happened, the military essentially turned to Suharto and said, there are a million students ready to march on the presidential palace, and we're not going to shoot them for you. Made me think that perhaps the Egyptian military was off to a similar start. Unfortunately, Egypt and the Egyptian military have not lived up to the impressive record of Indonesia's. So maybe you can help them out. They need help. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Pak Hayona, you, did you want to respond to any of that before we go into the question? No. Okay. Uh, well, I want to thank the panel for what I thought were um, very interesting and, and uh, provocative remarks. I'd like to ask, you, this is a theme that has come up throughout the conference today, and it's the question of trust. And I wonder, uh, I wonder quite frankly whether we've, whether the panel thinks that we have established a foundation of, of adequate trust to be able to move forward with our security relationship. And if you, if you do think so, I'd like you to say just briefly why, how do you know? And if you don't think so, uh, what can or should we do to get there? Maybe to start? Please. The, uh, I would say that we are <coughs> strictly in, this, in the security realm, we are building a foundation of trust. I, I think, and uh, um, Secretary Wolfowitz brought anecdotes out that can take us back through the generations on what underlies sort of the psychology behind the, 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 the relationship, the bilateral relationship. I think that um, such complex histories uh, running from those days, all the way through the days when we were, you know, where, where when we felt compelled to cut off assistance and support in reaction to uh, events in Indonesia and East Timor and these other issues, and then as we acknowledged transformation and change in Indonesia and and responded in kind with reengagement, I think it'd be it'd be too uh, it'd be too much to say that all of that history has just been tidily wrapped up in the past few years. And I think that those um, memories uh, run deep. And I think when it comes down to fundamental issues, Indonesia, not unlike other countries, um, will have a doubt about whether the United States would stick by them in a, in, a, in a pinch, because there are examples through the years of when we've 
you know, taken a pretty hard line and cut folks off because of uh, choices that have been made in those countries. So I think the I think what is happening is that regular interaction, habits of cooperation, the fact that we now engage strategically on issues of uh, of security, regional geopolitical issues, we can actually have. Um, you know, very genuine conversations about what's happening in the region and the world, and our bilateral dialogue is very rich now. Um, that coupled with actively doing things together, being reliable in our, the commitments we make, I think that is, is, is building a fundamental level of trust that will let us get there. There's also, there's also a degree of frankness and honesty. So where we have concerns, for example, the recent uh, Copasis incident that Pacayano was mentioning, um, we are able to simply, ex you know, talk about those concerns. What the impact will be if we see things go a one direction or another direction, we can, we're, we're, we, you know, so there's a there's a lot less, um, a lot less melodrama in the relationship than there might have been in the past, and that's part of this foundation of trust that I really think is building and is on a very good trajectory. Uh. That is why uh, I agree on the s statement this afternoon that I heard that Indonesia and the U.S. should stay on the course as the best of friends, not as an ally. Mm, right. This will, uh, this will, as a matter of fact, this will enhance the friendship between the two nations. I give you an example: when you send 600 Marines to Australia. That sends a jittery message to the uh, elite public of Indonesia. Mm. The rumors or the issue is that the U.S. is protecting Freeport in Papua. And furthermore, they will helping uh, the Sparatist Papua, things like that. So this is circling around the elite of Indonesian public. Uh, therefore, uh, the relationship should stay this way, as the best of friends, whatever differences that we might have, as long as it is not in the principle of democracy. Democracy, I agree, it's a universal thing, and it's good for Indonesia. We are blessed to have this democracy. And we prove that this democracy do not break up Indonesia. We're still the same. We have problem with uh, certain province, yeah, such as Papua, but we understand that the majority of the U.S. people, and especially the U.S. government, is in support that Papua is the integral part of Indonesia. And therefore, uh, whatever the view on Papua, especially the Papara uh, pendapat pendapat uh, rakyat in uh, no uh, the referendum on Papua in 1969 uh, uh, when one do not uh, agree on that it doesn't matter because we abide to the international law that the dutch has colonized uh, papua when they leave it becomes a part of indonesia so it, this is different than timor leste Moleste was colonized by Portugal, then yes, there is a question mark there, but not Papua. Therefore, uh, this is something that uh, I'm telling the, our, my colleagues in the Commission One not to be uh, worried about Benny Wenda movement in, 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 in London, or in Oxford. And yeah, this kind of thing, I hope that the, the two nations understand that Democracy has nothing to do with the integrity of a nation. Democracy, and as a matter of fact, should help, should assist the unity of a nation, because the unity of a nation is also nurturing democracy. It's also protecting the people and enhancing their welfare as a nation. And. Yes, I just mentioned to Mr. Wawowicz, I understood he was a, a dove before, and lately 
we, uh, we, we, we see him as a hawkish, but he mentioned to me, I'm still the same person, so. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, yeah. thanks. Paul, did you wanna say? I don't know if I have to give an explanation of <laughs> why I felt Saddam Hussein was different even from Suharto or Marcos, but we could go into that another time. But um, I think one has to, as I think Foreign Minister expressed it eloquently this morning, uh, have some general principles, but also think about specific cases, and I thought he was right about that. Um, I, um, let me refer to that speech, first of all. I mean, I think that uh, a certain distance between the U.S. and Indonesia is both inevitable and desirable, and uh, it's not Pure, I mean, it, admittedly, there's a little bit of lip service in the talk about non-alignment, given that non-alignment actually often means alignment <laughs> in the wrong direction. But Indonesia has a long tradition of non-alignment, and the U.S. actually, though you may not know it, has a pretty long history of looking the other way. When I was ambassador, I don't know if it's changed at all, but I would regularly get complaints from outside groups and occasionally from people in the U.S. government about Indonesia's, quote, terrible voting record at the U.N., and it was pretty terrible. It lined Indonesia up with some of the worst countries in the world. And my attitude was, who really cares? Uh, it's a throwaway. If the Indonesians want to vote that way, that's fine. It doesn't hurt us. Um, more substantively, if I take, for example, what the foreign minister said this morning, there's room to disagree. I don't think that what we suffer from with North Korea is a deficit of trust. I think we suffer from a country that is a, a bit screwed up, to put it understated. And one might almost say that our efforts to uh, make them feel better, to negotiate, to reward them for minor concessions like coming back and talking with us, have actually encouraged bad behavior rather than discouraged it. So it isn't, in general, I think it's important to keep channels of communications open, but sometimes, for example, when our ambassador to Baghdad in 1990 told Saddam that we didn't take any position on the border dispute between Iraq and Kuwait, that was not helpful communication. So it's not always a good thing, but it's not bad at all to have a country of Indonesia's stature with whom we have a long-standing relationship that pushes that line maybe a little too hard, but we need to hear it because maybe we push the other line a little too hard. So I think a little tension in the relationship, especially given that we manage it as well as I think we do, is actually kind of a good thing. Um, I, I mean, I said how positive I feel about IMED a few minutes ago, but IMED is also a potential target of people who want to make trouble in the relationship. I, maybe that's a little unfair. People who have grievances against Indonesia look for a target in American legislation, and historically, at least, I met was one of the most available ones. It seems to me we're past that, at least for the time being, but I would not encourage people to think it's, it's purely history. I, in, I would say, by the way, uh, in support of what Pahayono said, not only has democracy not led to the breakup of Indonesia, I would argue that without a democratic government prepared to negotiate on reasonable terms with the people of Aceh, Aceh might have broken off. And I think it's important not to be too complacent about Papua's status in Indonesia based on a 1969 referendum or based on the history of the Dutch colonies. Uh, People are going to be looking for ways to make it an international issue, for ways to make it a Christian versus Muslim issue. And I think it is important for Indonesia's integrity, for our relations, and for the people of Papua to focus on how to be in a position to make a very good argument, I think a very good argument can be made, that the Papuans are much better off in Indonesia than in Papua New Guinea right next door. Uh, it's a difficult problem, but I think uh, it has the pot and it has the potential to become a more difficult one if it's not handled properly. So I would really, I'm not in a position to say ha what that means, but I really think it's important not to be complacent. Um, 
and I, I think I will leave it there. Okay. Let me open the floor to, uh, to questions, please. And ag again, the same rules. Just please uh, identify yourself and your organization. Uh, Wayne. By um, uh, remembering a former a pilot before Pope, uh, Bobby, I forget his name, the first pilot, uh, Bobby Freeberg, the first pilot that flew f an in, uh, in the Indonesian Air Force, died for the Indonesian Republic's formation, um, 1947, I think, 48. Uh, I met his um, uh, one of his ancestors. In 1999 or 2000, I can't remember, after Suharto fell, I got a call from the Indonesian embassy. Um, the head of the Indonesian police college is coming to New York. Can you help him out? So I, you know, that's not what I normally do. I work for a chamber of commerce. But I called John Jay College of Criminal Justice. They're in the phone book. I said, there's an Indonesian police uh, rector that's coming and just wants to make contact. I called the New York City Police Academy. We met with them. They took two cadets a year on scholarship. We worked that out. We went in to see the John Jay criminal justice people. This is now the police are separated from the military now. This is what he said. And uh, the provo of John Jay had worked in the Philippines on the demilitarization of the Indonesian police. And he looked at the the rector from Indonesia, and he said, what kind of police do you want to be? Do you want to be the type of police that, you know, puts people in jail and keeps order, or do you want to be the type of police that helps a citizen rescue a cat that went up the tree? You know, he sort of set up this dichotomy of what, what, you, what type of uh, security force you're going to be. So my question really is, what's going on today with the separation of the police from the military? And are they moving in this kind of civilianization process, this demilitarization process? How is that going? Uh, is Thanks. the parliament happy about that? And you know, what are the observations you have? Thank you, Wayne. Let me take a, we'll, we'll load up a couple questions here. Uh, in the back, uh, Yaru. Good afternoon, uh, Excellencies. My name is Heru Pramayuda. I'm from Sai Chief South Queens University. I have a question regarding uh, the military intervention in politics. Uh, to what extent is the, the current and new development of a cooperation, a military cooperation between the United States and Indonesia putting us concern over uh, the possibility of intervention of, of military and politics in the future of Indonesia, provided uh, the anecdotal uh, the, the very first historical reason, if I may recall correctly, General Nasution, who put in place a Fungsi concept, is educated uh, militarily in the United States. And with the military uh, uh, tend to intervene in politics by being the most organized and the most functioning, effectively functioning institutions, how is this becoming a threat to Indonesian democracy in the future if uh, the military advance so rapidly uh, that the bureaucratic uh, cannot catch up with it? and they decided to break the lockdown by intervening once again. Is this something that the US, uh, within the concept of uh, cooperation, uh, ever consider uh, or not? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and we'll take a question here in the front, front table here. Ted Fishman, um, would you mind commenting or at least giving an overview of what Indonesia needs to do with its Navy, uh, particularly in light of Chinese designs on resource security uh, that reach into Southeast Asia. Okay, uh, let's go with those three. Uh, we have a question about police uh, military relationship, mil possibility of military intervention in politics, and how do we think about it, and what role for the <coughs> Indonesian Navy? Ayana, you want to start? Uh, yes, to tell you truthfully. One of the problems, the main problems of our uh, democracy in Indonesia is the well-being between the military and the police. You mentioned correctly that the police in the past is part of the military, but now 
as a concerns of uh, democracy, they are being separated. And this is especially clear. The, the problem arises when the police, through Densus 88, uh, is the main uh, apparatus to deal with terrorism. They were given uh, not just budget, but the authority which sometimes uh, create uh, uh, jealousy. jealousy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> jealousy from the military. Because in the past, the police is the little brother of the army. But now, the police has become the main apparatus to deal with terrorists. And this, in a way, creates problems. Because the police, the Den Society 8, cannot share confidential uh, secret information even to the army. This is the process that is happening in Indonesia. And hopefully, uh, in line with increasing the professionalism of Indonesian military, this can fade away. This problem can fade away. That is why Commission One is in support to Indonesian modernizing its military. And as a balance, what is uh, happening in the, in the fact that the military is not the number one apparatus to deal with terrorism. But we, are, we but be clear, when dealing with separatists, then Commission One would think that this is the, the job of the military, not the police. Yeah. Separatists with, with arms. When separatists without arms, then it's the police. But with arms, it should be the military, yeah. just like the states, I think. When you deal with, you don't have separatists in the states. Uh, we have. So, uh, is Puerto Rico is part of the states? What's that? It's Puerto Rico? Rico? No. no, no. It's a territory. It's a territory. territory. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, this is something that Texas is. Texas is a state, though. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, I don't think that you will stay quiet when Texas is being claimed by <laughs> <laughs> your neighbor. <laughs> so. In answering that, the possibility of the military intervening in Indonesian politics, no way. Since the, since the amendment of our constitution, it's your constitution too, there is no way that the military can intervention into politics. And the military respect the new constitutions. And therefore, once again, we must ensure not to be complacent that in every election, that the public appreciate democracy. The problem with the media, I have to say this, uh, the media tend to make the culprit into the institutions like DPR. The media can bang on every single anggota DPR, yeah, in every me DPR member. We, I always said to, the, to my friends in media, you can say whatever you, you, you will, as hard as you can, on every individual who make a wrongdoing in the parliament, but not in the institutions. Because you, if you keep on, on uh, banging on the institutions, then it will bang also on democracy. The people will see democracy has no value, has no uh, benefits for the people. And this is dangerous. At the moment, we enjoy high economic. We're still fine. But what happened if our economy is in, in, is in the downturn? Can we still preserve democracy? That is a big question that we have to, to meet. And then the third, the Navy. Indonesia is an archipelagic nation. As a matter of fact, we have to have a strong Navy and a strong Air Force. Yeah. In the past, the Army is the number one. 
but in the future, it has to be equal, maybe more on Navy and the Air Force. Since we are geographically such a large nation, comprises of 17,500 islands, and we have to protect our borders, and we have to make a clear message to everyone that please respect our borders, because within ASEAN, we still have border problem within ASEAN nations. Yeah. We solved the problem with Vietnam for 31 years negotiation. But with Malaysia up till now, they still claim Ambalat. And that is no way we're gonna give up Ambalat. We have given up to respect the, the international court. Sipadan Ligitan has gone to Malaysia, but come on, not again. Ambalat. This is something uh, we hope that within ASEAN we should have this understanding not to hurt each other. But once again, ASEAN is a blessed to Indonesia. Hopefully ASEAN can be a good example on how we deal crisis within nations for other parts of the, of the world. And although we might not hope to see ASEAN becomes EU. Yeah. The EU is a different matter. I don't, I don't think you know, uh, ASEAN should be EU. Yeah. ASEAN should be uh, to be in present because Indonesia, yes, sometimes it worries me when you mention Indonesia is a regional leader, ASEAN leader. We are not ASEAN leader. Yeah. We don't wish to be said that way because ASEAN is created to solve the problems in the 1960s. We learn from our mistakes on, uh, on confrontasi with Malaysia and Singapore. We wish not that to happen again. Therefore, uh, ASEAN is something that we need to take care of, and that is why the Navy is very important, to ensure that our border will stay intact and and then that is forever. Thank you. Uh, Vikram or Paul, do you want to say anything? Uh, I'll just uh, very briefly, uh, I'll echo uh, Marty from this morning, not the regional leader, but a regional leader. Um, <laughs> and I think everyone would agree that Indonesia is a regional leader and very important one. On, on, the, on the police, I think it's, we're seeing a gradual process by which the military focuses on external threats and mm -hmm. things of that nature with the separatism being the outlier. And obviously I think enduring political solutions will be the answer to that. But um, naturally there are growing pains in that, in that process. Uh, but it is, in, I, I think, entirely for the good and it was a wise choice to give the police the levels, the, the responsibilities that have been given to the police. And I think we'll see a lot of evolution in Indonesia on, on that front. I, I too do not uh, you know, see in my day-to-day -day work any indications that there's a real risk of a military intervention in politics. You know, obviously, you, you know, you know, you can always have concerns about that, but it's a fairly, uh, it's a, it is, it is, it is, it is fairly clear that Indonesia's leaders, civilian and military, are. Uh, committed to the trajectory the country is on. And it is also very clear that Indonesian media, civil society, courts, and parliament are robust, uh, you know, it is, a, it is, it is, it is, a, it would, it would be, you know, it would be quite a thing for that to happen. But I noted the comment that, uh, you know, p even people who've had U.S. military education may, uh, may be on the wrong side of these things. And, you know, let me just state that you, getting U.S. training in U.S. military schools is not a panacea. It doesn't cure all things. There certainly are, there, you know, there, there, there are, there certainly are times when, um, people go the wrong direction, even you know, even if they've been exposed to the best of training. Um, but I don't, I, I just don't expect anything in that regard. On the Navy question, the only thing I would add uh, to Hayano's points is that the is that I think one of the questions for Indonesia and the rest of the region is maritime law enforcement, that is Whitehall versus Greyhall capabilities. Um, the countries around the South China Sea uh, have remarkably limited maritime domain awareness capabilities and also have an, uh, in general, fair, you know, overly modest uh, maritime security capabilities. They don't have enough Navy or uh, 
Coast Guard type assets. Um, and the reliance on naval assets increasingly uh, runs the risk of sparking conflicts by the apparent militarization of any given situation. Um, you know, I would say that sometimes that's been dealt with opportunistically, uh, you know, so countries can use the excuse of a you know, gray hull ship showed up, so therefore we have to react, and I think that's what we saw China do in the case of the Scarborough Shoal, actually, was to, to react to a Filipino naval vessel being there. But now you do see a concerted effort across the region to build up maritime security capabilities on the naval side, but also on the uh, civilian maritime law enforcement side. Paul, would you like to wait? Three comments. Very quickly, in sort of reverse order. Um, the reason I told that Mordani story applies with respect to the Navy now. It would be crazy for Indonesia to bankrupt itself dealing with a China threat that isn't even close to the horizon, or, and probably even if it were closer, it would be a mistake, I think, to concentrate on that level of capability as opposed to the more immediate surveillance capabilities that have been mentioned. I think the question seemed to suggest the possibility of a military coup in Indonesia. I think it's inconceivable. The military couldn't possibly govern the country, and I think they know that. Uh, it's way beyond that at this point, which is a very good thing. But finally, <laughs> I want to just make a slight dissent on this, all the applause for separating the police from the military. And I don't mean it by saying I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. I think it was needed. But I certainly, some of my colleagues in the U.S. government, I thought, were overly rigid in, in their application of what they thought was the principle that the police does internal security and the military is only for external security. Um, and first of all, I have the impression, and I'm happy to be corrected on this, but that one of the bad consequences of what's been done is there's virtually now no adult supervision of the police because the police now report directly to the commander in chief and the commander in chief, President Uriono, does not have time to, to micromanage the police. So I'm, it, there, I think that's a problem that needs to be corrected. Secondly, people who sort of took the American model forgot that the United States doesn't have a national police force, much as the FBI might aspire to be one. They're very local police. There's extraordinary local supervision. And it seems to me that Indonesia probably needs to go somewhat in that direction, although maybe that would just make the corruption problem in the police, which is quite serious, even worse. But I, and then finally, um, I'm not for bringing the military back into heavy involvement in security matters, but we call out our military when there's a natural disaster. We call out our military on the rare occasions when there's massive civil disorder. Uh, the, I can't imagine that it would be a good thing to start training the Indonesian police to deal with that sort of problem. And yet the lack of that capability may be part of the reason why these church burnings go uh, unpunished. Back about 10 years ago in the first, uh, I think it was still Megawati was the president, when there was terrible fighting in Poso between Christians and Muslims, almost on the verge of ethnic cleansing. And when it was suggested perhaps it would be good to have some Indonesian military forces that are trained to deal with civil disturbance, within the US government at least, there was an almost ideological opposition to that because no, no, that's the police responsibility. Well, the police, I don't think, well, I don't know, someone tell me it obviously is sort of calmed down, but probably just because of people got worn out, I don't think it was because there was an effective security presence. So it, it's a good trend, it's the right direction, but I think it requires a little bit of revisiting. Well, uh, before I ask you to join me in thanking the panel, I want to say a couple words of thanks to you. Um, you have been a great uh, audience today. I know there's a lot of talent in this audience. This uh, conference has been uh, a step towards uh, capturing some of what, was been, what has been discussed today and will be pulled together into a report called the U.S.-Indonesia Relationship at 2020. And hopefully that report will uh, include some very useful recommendations for both our governments, companies, and civil society. So I hope you'll, if you have ideas, please contact us uh, at the South CSIS uh, Southeast Asia program. We'd love to hear from you. Please join me in thanking this outstanding panel uh, for, their, for their help. Thank you very much. And thank you again to, uh, to our sponsors and to all of you for joining us today. Thank you, and good night.